Hi, um, today I'm going to share with you 11 pages of slides that summarizes my nine month worth of work of hard work in this capstone project titled AI Guided Financial Trading. Good afternoon everyone, my name is Melissa Tan. So the aim of this project is to, uh, sorry, can I just move this up a little bit? The aim of this project is to develop an autonomous trading system that uses reinforcement learning to learn and make a profitable trading decision. So the motivation behind this is, suppose you predict that the Bitcoin price is gonna jump from 10,000 to $10,070, then you're gonna buy two Bitcoin. One is filled at $10,000 and the other one is filled at 10,010. And the reason for that is actually called the price slippage. And that is because when you start buying, the demand for, the, for that stock increases. So people, it will push up the price a little bit. So when you buy the Bitcoin, you obviously incur a 0.3% commission. And if you look at this table at the bottom here, you see that you, you pay $30 commission and $30 commission on the other one. So on day zero, you're out of pocket by $20,070. Over the next few days, you also incur a, a holding fees of 0.01%, and that equates to about $2 every day you keep holding on to the Bitcoin. And just say on day five, the Bitcoin price really went up to $10,070. You go, woohoo, my prediction is correct. So you start to sell one of the stock or two of the stock. So one of the stock is sold at $10,070, and the other one is sold at $10,000 and 65. And obviously you pay a 0.3% commission and that equates to $60 and 41 cents. Uh, but if you look at this ledger here, by the end of the day, you didn't end up making any money at all. In fact, you actually lost $5 and 47 cents. So this is a very simple illustration of, of what could go wrong. <clears throat> Even though you made a correct prediction, you still end up losing some money. So let's see what or how machine learning can help us with this problem. And here's a quick introduction of what machine learning is. In classical machine learning, we have supervised and unsupervised learning. In supervised learning, what typically happens is you are given in the training time, you're given a label. So for example, you're given a picture of a cat in your toe. This is a cat and another picture of a cat and another picture of a cat and another picture of a cat. So by 10,000 picture, you'll probably be able to identify what is a cat. And if I show you another 10,000 pictures of a dog, you probably understand how does a dog look like. Then you have regression. Regression is where you, you get the machine to learn to find the function to fit the continuous number. This is uh, good if you want to use this to predict a house prices or life expectancy, something like that. And in unsupervised learning, you have uh, other stuff such as clustering, uh, where you want to find similar patterns of items. And you can also find associations and dependencies. And finally, you can also use that for dimension reduction. <coughs> And reinforcement learning is the core uh, uh, thing that in this project that I've been using. Reinforcement learning is basically a learning approach to automate decision-making process through repetition, learning, and self-evaluation. So how does this work? Basically, it uses a framework called Markov Decision Process, which uses a mathematical representation of sequential decision-making process. Um, this picture here actually illustrates everything that I've just said. And when people ask me to explain what reinforcement learning is, I typically like to give an example of driving a car because we can all relate to it very easily. So suppose you are asked to drive a car and you don't know how to drive a car. What do you do? You try every single thing. You might turn on this button and you might find that it starts to change or you start to get your windscreen going on, but that's not what you want. Or you might end up going backwards and bang your car. 
And as a result of that, you get a negative reward. But if, for example, you are given a target to go to that corner slightly to the left, and your objective is to get there without banging your car. So I'll try every single move. I'll go one step forward and I, oh, nothing happened, but I'm closer to my objective. And then you get a point. So for every single step that you get, you accumulate a experience and you also learn what to do and what not to do. Another example that I could give you is if halfway through your journey, you're met with a traffic light, a red traffic light. If you do not know what a red traffic light is, you just went past, but what happens? You get a ticket. So you remember the next time you're not gonna do that, okay? So here's a little bit of a history lesson. Um, for those of you who have studied finance would have heard of the gentleman called Eugene Farman. Back in 1970s, his efficient market hypothesis states that the market is a reflection of fair value. And it is impossible to gain competitive advantage through predictive analysis. But that is back in 1970s. Fast forward, 50 years or 49 years, there are thousands of literatures that actually contradict what he has just said. And I pulled up one of this literature by Mastery and he done this literature in 2017. And he quote that these studies provide significant evidence that technical analysis achieve abnormal returns in efficiency period. And in, 20, in 2019, Henrik et al, uh, reviewed 57 literature and found that the most commonly used machine learning algorithm for finance is support vector machine and neural network. And he also concluded that this research team is still very relevant. In 2018, Fisher did a review on almost 50 publications and he draws an insight and said that the actor only approach currently appears to be the best suited approach in the finance market. Okay, this page basically summarizes the trading algorithm that I've developed, uh, modified from a GitHub repository from the benchmark that I've been using. The data that I've been using is DJIA, which is Dow Jones Industrial Average. I pull out about 28 stocks, and the training data is from 1st of January 2000 to 31st December 2015. The test data is from 4th of January 2016 to, 30, to 21st September 2018. We gave the agent an in, initial investment of $10,000. And the algorithm that I use is called the proximal policy optimization. Basically how it works is it updates the policy by taking the largest step uh, to improve the performance while relies on a specialized clipping. In summary, what that actually meant is, if we go back to the car driving scenario, by the time you accumulate enough experience, you know that the direction that you ought to go is that way. But in this, in this algorithm, what it does is, it actually gives you a little bandwidth, just like a GPS where you have the blue color bandwidth. It allows you to go a little bit out and explore other alternatives. Because you might not know that there may be an underground dungeon that gives you a shortcut to get to the other place faster. So that's the basic idea of what this policy is doing. And if you look at this chart here, the bottom line here is the algo is the, is the agent that hasn't been trained. And the yellow one is um, where we give it a small clipping, which is about 0.25. And the green one is with the clipping of 0 0.3. And with the clipping of 0 0.35, which is a little bit larger, you see that the performance of the uh, agent is not that great anymore. And this is based on uh, 0 0.01 learning rate, as well as a commission of zero percentage. Then we look at the comparison of the use of technical indicator. Um, the yellow line basically uh, mean, meant that it is not using a technical indicator, which is the one at the top here. And the green one uh, shows the agent that uses technical indicator. 
The one that did not use technical indicator at the first glance, it looks really, really good because it has actually has gone above $100,000. Whereas the one without technical indicator was just slightly above $20,000. But I'd like to draw your attention to the test result over here, which is the one colored. Um, one thing to notice is uh, it seems that the agent that did not use a technical indicator seems to be over exaggerated during the training or by 10 times or five times. Whereas the one that uses a technical indicator was pretty much on par with the test result. And then we look at how the agent actually behaves during the training. On the left hand side here, this is the agent that did not use a technical indicator. So you can see there's not a lot of activities going on. But with the agent that uses a technical indicator and all the indicators are listed at the bottom here, you can actually see that there's a lot of activities going on. So you can actually say that it is actually making a decision based on the extra information. And this chart here, uh, these two charts here, illustrate the comparison of the benchmark that I've done against a previous uh, literature. Uh, this, this on the left hand side is the chart which I took from Xiong and in, in his paper called Practical Deep Reinforcement Learning and that is dated 2018. He uses the model called DDPG which is Deep Deterministic Policy Gradient and using $10,000 as the initial investment value, his model achieved 25.87 annualized return over that period. And in this side is the PPO model that I've been using. Using the same exact same data set um, as zero commission, this model is able to achieve 34.06 annualized return. And that is shown on this top line here. And with the 0.1 commission, you see it on the yellow line here. And obviously when you increase the commission, your portfolio value, it will go down a little bit as well. So in summary, this table here actually shows you the comparison of Xiong and the comparison of what I've done using PPO with 0.3 clipping. Um, in their model, DDPG achieved 25.87, whereas the PPO model achieved 34.06. And with commission, it was going at 24.4. And when we use technical indicator with 0% commission, we achieve about 27.47% as well. So in fact, we can actually summarize that PPO outperforms DDPG when zero commission is imposed, but is marginally lower when 0.5% commission is imposed. We also see the impact of technical indicator on how it actually encouraged the agent to make more informed decision. And you also saw the distinct change in the agent's behavior. Last but not least, there's a little bit of disclosure here. The data that has been using is inherently going on the upward trend anyway. Um, so this, date, this model may not be tested on other data sets, so it may not be suitable for real trading. So for future work, perhaps we can uh, explore the remaining technical indicator and put in some stop loss and other constraints and also explore other algorithms. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Thanks, Melissa. So any question to Melissa? Uh, um, because based on your experimental results, it seems like the test accuracy is much lower than the training results. Correct. So it means the data is overfitting on the training data set. So have you considered, because I haven't done anything about reinforcement learning, but it is a neural network. A neural network means there are some methods to um, prevent the overfitting. Yep. So have you considered anything to do, like how to prevent the overfitting in the future analysis? Yep. Um, a lot of this algorithm that I've been using, it comes from the library called Stable Baseline. So they do have a lot of uh, parameters where, where you can actually use to control or to add in some noises. 
So I have to admit, I only got about six weeks to actually get this up and running to get to a point where it actually can generate a result. So admittingly, I did not go into that detail into, into um, exploring more about the overfeeding because my main objective is to see whether technical indicator can affect the decision-making process of the agent. About the blue bandwidth, the yeah. blue bandwidth, like you know, your algorithm explores the left and the right of the blue bandwidth, but this is like not blue in that manner. Yeah. Can you explain that a little more? Like, what is like it's trying to achieve something like different, right? Yeah. Okay. So the, the it can get stuck somewhere and <laughs> never reach the goal, right? So how are you coping for that? Okay. The way reinforcement learning works is you get it to you give it a target. Sometimes it may not reach a target and it dies. So you restart, okay? The blue bandwidth is just my way of trying to explain to everyone here where you are using the GPS, the blue bandwidth. Because if you go off the blue bandwidth, uh, the GPS will say you have detoured from your route. You need to recalibrate. So the blue bandwidth in this scenario is just to allow the agent to explore some other stuff that may or may not improve the, the performance of the model. It just doesn't allow you, the, the whole idea is to allow the agent to you know, be more flexible instead of just, this is what you must do. So if, you, if I go up to this uh, slide again, this one, you see that this brown one where I've given it a, a really wide uh, clipping, which means that it can actually do a lot more stuff. And you see that the performance actually is lower than the 0 0.3 performance. It's just a guideline for the agent not to stray too far away. It went down. Yeah, exactly. So right. you still have to guide it a little, right? You still need to guide it, yeah. So you implemented it on this uh, index. Uh, do you think if we could uh, implement it on individual stock, so it could still show a good performance, it can still outperform the normal return of the stock? In individual stock? Yes, In, instead of index, yep. like this BJIA so index of 28 stocks. Yep. So if we implement this, uh, PPO2 based uh, reinforcement learning on an, any individual stock such mm -hmm. as Microsoft or Apple. Yep. Do you think it still could outperform the normal yep. return? Actually, I did test it on two other um, stocks, uh, Apple and Microsoft together. Um, it, it was still showing better results. Although I didn't show it in this presentation. <laughs> All right, so thank you very much, Melissa. If uh, we don't have any more questions, so then we can just uh, give a thank you. Uh, big hand to, to Lisa, thanks. Thank you very much.